Michael Vannon, welcome back to another Era Quinn Caledrum video. Uh, we've got a lot going on lately, and we are back and yes. forth in the middle of a couple series and a bunch of tournaments, and it's been a lot of fun. And of course, it's back to school season for us locally where we live, so we've been busy. Yeah. But we've been thinking for a while about armies in Middle Earth. We've been thinking about the armies that we play, we've been thinking about some armies we'd like to play. Um, there are some videos that we have in this playlist. If you look at our our Armies of Middle Earth playlist. We've got some videos from other people whom we trust and we are learning from. And some oh, of the yeah. channels that we follow, like the DCHL particularly, Devin, does a oh, great yeah. job explaining His videos are perfect. how to play and how to buy. And Because, of course, if you're starting a new army, it really helps to know where do you start. Exactly. So, how yeah. do you play? How do you buy? So great videos in this playlist. They're not Most of them are not from us. So you know, kudos yep. to the DCHL guys and people we link to there. Definitely, we love their videos. We encourage you to subscribe to their channels. And we try not to make videos that they've already made. Yeah, they've done something. a great job. So. We're trying to learn different armies. So we're working on a bunch of armies that we know. Last time, Estenes, I'm Atark. He's Estenes. Um, he gave a review on Goblin Town because he's had some good success with Goblin Town and knows how to make that army work Which, for him. by the way, if you had to watch that video, I am sorry. That was awful. <laughs> like, yes, but it's the review, good. There's good stuff in I it. I said everything I wanted to say, but uh, just the quality of the video. Ooh. We're learning. We're good. We're here to have fun. Um, but today, we're going to talk about Azog's Hunters. Because this is one he's been playing for a little while. I'm working on a couple, and we'll have some more videos I for you love later. I this army. It's like my second favorite army to play right now. Of course, the first being Goblin Town. All the but... armies have different strengths and weaknesses. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about what's been working and not working. He's got some opinions on that that are informed now. And we're going to talk about how you ally, how you list build, talk about yep. strengths and weaknesses in the oh, faction. Um, talk about how you shop for this faction. If you were going to list build, where do you start? Which, ironically, there is actually... With most armies, there is a very specific list of things there, that you will get, a couple, but even more there's so a couple with do's, this army. Yeah, a couple do's, a couple don'ts. Some very so, obvious do's and don'ts. Where do you want to start? Uh, right at the beginning, same place that Devin starts, ironically enough. Strengths and weaknesses overall for the faction. So, when you look at Azog's Hunters, the first thing you got to note, well, first off, they don't have very many options. So, that would be a weakness. The fact that they've only got one type of infantry and one type of cavalry X type unit the fell wargs i wouldn't really like they're not that good but you always should take a couple which we'll get into later um damage output is the biggest strength of this army considering that everything in the faction is strength four or above that relatively cheap for strength four too yeah all of their infantry are eight points fell wargs and hunter works alike and that makes it very easy to do the math to make this army actually um, their infantry, like their generic hunter works, are actually ridiculously good. The fact that they all have two value. attacks at eight points is scary. Like the That's amount of these four. guys that you can get that just rips through your opponent's infantry. It's great. Um, they've actually got a whole ton of shooting, especially with their faction bonus that gives them the 50% bows and the improved shoot value. Um, they've got solid heroes. They've got a whole bunch of really cheap heroes, which you should always take, which we will get into later. Um, and then they've got two ridiculously powerful big tank heroes. Um, they've also got high mobility. They've got really cheap mobile units. And in addition to that, they've got the option to mount every single one of their heroes on a warg, which you should always mount your heroes if you have the option. Those are fell wargs even, right? Yeah, so you don't even need a line of sight. It's really funny when you can catch your big hero behind a building and they think they're safe and you're just like, nope. Fell wargs, I see you anyway. Right. Exactly. Yeah, um, if you don't know that. You're probably going to talk more about this, but fell yeah. wargs have the fell sight special rule, which means they see you even if they don't see you. They try to figure that one out, right? Sort of sixth it's, sense instinct. It's they, really funny. Yeah. Most people are aware of this, but if they aren't, it's really funny when you catch them off guard and they're like, oh, I did not realize Azog could charge. That sucks. Even when they <laughs> can't see you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it buffs the hero. It's a very significant advantage sometimes. Um, sure. So high mobility and versatility and whatnot. <laughs> Just sorry, just to make sure you caught it. Cheap mobility, eight points for high mobility. That matters. Uh, on top of that, they have cheap might, as stated before, with their cheap heroes, which all have three might points. Uh, specifically, the triple on taunt, Narzug, Fimble, and Yasneg. Um, they also have access to free might in their allies, which we will get into later. Basically, this army should always have about twelve might points if you're looking at seven hundred points and up. Even in the 600 point range, you should be pushing that number. Like, you have a lot of might in this faction. Going into weaknesses, uh, obviously low defense. Like, everything in this army, the infantry are all defense 4, and the heroes are all defense 5. 
The only exception to this is Bulk, which is Defense 7 for some weird reason, because he's got metal stapled into his skin. But yeah, everything is ridiculously low defense. Azog is even stuck at Defense 5, because he can't purchase the heavy armor while he's part of the Azog's Hunters. Uh, there is a way to get around this, which we'll talk about later. Um, low fight value. Your infantry are all fight 3, your heroes are fight 4 for most part, except for Fimble, who is fight 5, and Azog and Bulk, which are fight 7. So you're going to be who, outfought by who, most armies. And who has heroic strike? Um, four heroes actually, all the ones that matter. You've got your two big guys, which obviously have heroic strike. Organ um, yeah. And then I'll get in again into more reasoning for why you should take certain heroes over others later. But Fimble and Yasneg both have heroic strike. But Fimble uses this much better because he's also fight five, whereas Yasneg is fight four. This means that even if you have Heroic Strike on those heroes, some use it better than others. You also have, in terms of weaknesses, you have low courage. Your infantry are all courage 2. Your heroes are generally courage 4 if they're a named hero, or courage 5 if they're Azog or Bulk. So even your big heroes could potentially fluff a courage test. So it sucks when you break. They also have relatively weak archery. They have lots of it. I mentioned it as a strength. It's a strength in the sense that they have tons of it. You should always have 50% of your army with bows. And when we get into list building, you'll see you should always maximize your shooting. But at the same time, it's relatively weak. It's a 4 plus shoot with a strength 2 bow. It's not going to do very much. And it's not like a core part of your strategy. It's just something you can have as an option. Say your opponent doesn't have any, you suddenly have like 20 shots. And they're just free dice that you can throw at your opponent until lines meet. Um, there are some general overarching strategies, which we should touch on before we get into list building. There are really three ways to play this army. There's the sit and shoot, and if you're going to do this, you should take bulk. There's then the horde of orcs, where you just take Yasnag, Fimble, Narzug, and then you just hoard as many hunter orcs as you possibly can, which is also completely valid, because they're all two attacks, and they're all strength four. Um, so at that point, you're rushing in to make the lines meet, though, so those two attacks can do some work for you. Yeah, but you're pushing, like, 40, 50 models, and it's insane how many... It, like, that's a lot of killing power. Um, and then there's my preferred tactic, which I just like to call the Azog Kills All, which is literally what it sounds. You take Azog and then as many Hunter Orcs as you can fit, and it's a great strategy. Um, list building. There are some general pointers that go over all the different point values, and then there are specific point values there you should take Maybe specific before things. Before we get into that, you mentioned that if you take the archery build, you should take Bulg. you want to yes. explain why? Um, so again, we're going to get into this in a moment, but Bulg has mortal arrows. So he literally just has it for free. It's a special rule that he has, but for some reason he has to pay... He pays five points for his bow, which has it, but he has the rule in his profile. So technically, <laughs> so even if he doesn't pay to take a bow, he still has a mortal arrow, which rule. doesn't make much sense. But basically, there are some bulls in the game, but that's okay. Every hunter work in your army gets mortal arrows if you have bulk, which they're just a gimmick. But at the same time, it's super good because every time you wound a model with mortal arrows, if they have multiple wounds, then every turn after they have to roll the dice, and on a roll of the one, they take another wound. Is that automatic, or do you have to roll to see if they're poisoned when they're hit? No, they're just automatically. Unless they so save this it is with the fate, because then you're, they're not wounded. Right, so if you build an archery list, and you've got a hero like Bolg in your faction, you want to make sure that you're catering yeah. to the build of your list. If it's an archery list, and you have advantages that suit and favor archery, then use yeah. them, right? So Bolg, exactly. if you've got an archery list, Bolg makes your archers more effective, you should take Bolg, because then all of your archery, every shot that you take has this extra opportunity which is just a gimmick but it's which, really but you nice might as well if you're going to build an archery list and have your army is there to shoot bows then you make sure they're effective bows. which particularly in the new meta when it's all about big heroes you're typically going to be dumping all of your shots into that one big hero and you might get one or two lucky wounds and suppose one of them does get through fate you suddenly have a 16 percent chance to wound them every single turn for free, for free which is great um so in terms of list building General overarching things, as I said before, maximize your archery. You have a 50% bow limit, you should be using it all the time. Even though they're like crappy bows, if your opponent, for whatever reason, doesn't have very much archery, say they have like an elven list where they're based around combat and they have four shots just because. I have seen that before. Or they have a Gondor list, which for whatever reason they've decided to hoard out on standard Gondorian archers. You can, the match mega shield wall. you can match them for shooting. And if you can match them, 
the way that you count this, you count how many bows you have, how many bows they have, and compare your hit values and your strengths. So if you outnumber them in shots, and you also outnumber them in terms of how much potential damage you can do, then you can comfortably sit back and shoot. If you have more shots, you might not necessarily be doing the same more damage than them. So suppose I have 8 crossbows versus 12 hunter work bows. In that situation, I just straight up rush yeah. into combat. The eight crossbows are likely going to hit on the same values and do a lot more damage. They do a, a lot, lot more damage, especially against a defense for a line of hunter orcs. Yeah, hunter run. orcs are particularly vulnerable to archery, and you should always take that into consideration whenever you're debating sitting back and shooting. Yeah, you should always take into account that they're likely wounding why? you a lot easier than you're wounding them. Wait, and why, right? Because if you're going to sit back and shoot, the whole the only reason you would ever do that is to thin down their numbers before yeah. you get into combat, because you will get into combat at some point. Yeah. And if you're trying to thin down their numbers before you get into combat, you don't want them thinning you faster than you're thinning them. So yeah, if you're standing against a crossbow gun, gun line, they're going to thin you out faster than you'll thin them. So yeah. make sure you make sure you play your strategies carefully. And general rule of thumb, unless you have like three times as many bows, never sit back and shoot against elves. Right. I wouldn't because <laughs> they're going to win. <laughs> even if I had three times as many bows, which I have had before, I just straight up rush into combat anyway. Like it's not worth the risk. It's scary how effective elven archers are. Um, and, so anyway. and that's driven by hit value, and there's two things that drive that, Tell me if you disagree. Hit values, because the archers from the elven side are going to hit you way more than you're going to hit them. Yeah. And defense comparisons. Their defense, they're going to have armor. They're going to be defense 5 and 6. You're going to be defense 4. Yeah. So they hit you easier, and they kill you faster. They're strength 3 bows to your strength 2 bows. And they kill you easier because you're lower defense. Like you're just you're down on everything. So you might as well just run in and take advantage of your dice because at least you've got two attacks to try to swarm in because your point values are lower than theirs per model. You're gonna have more models, yeah. so you're probably pulling well, heroic sometimes. marches even just to get in there and try to challenge them quicker. So in terms of list building, this definitely changes depending on point value. Always maximize your shooting. In terms of like mobility, you should always have two cavalry. And when I say two cavalry, I mean two hunter orcs mounted on warks. Only two. Two is enough. And then you should have two or more fell works in addition to that. Straight works. Generally with no speak, riders. Yeah, with no riders. Generally, eight is too many in terms of fell works. You should have like up to six, depending on point value. The minimum I would go with is two cab and two fell works. So four that can run around. Why? Exactly. Why? Two of them are mounted for the knockdown bonuses. Two of them are not, but they're fast moving infantry. Now, if you've played a lot of competitive missions before, you'll know that there are certain missions like Heirlooms and like Seize the Prize, where if you dig it up, you have to be on foot. You have to, to be actually, an infantry model. With yeah, to dig it up keyword. or carry it. So the fell wargs are really good for that. But even if they're not being used in that mission, you've got four fast models which can wrap around your flanks. And what that can do is because you often outnumber your opponent, they can just crush around to the spear supports. And at that point, you're breaking it off, and it's one-on-one -on -one engagements. So you and have your one -on -one two attack guys on the front row, and you have your guy who just charged and gets two dice on yeah. the back row. You've trapped things. You're getting a knockdown on one side. You're getting double dice on both sides. And you're... often they, the fast-moving models just end up as like sacrifices just to tie up the spears. They often just die off really fast. But what it does is it just gives you that one turn where it's one-on-one -on -one engagements almost all the way across the front line. And that's when you can do insane amounts of damage. And at that point, there's no stopping you because you've already cracked a hole in their battle line. Um, always take so a banner. The, that's the plan, at least. <laughs> that's the plan, yeah. Always take a banner because that helps crack the hole in the battle because line. Because you're a one-rank army. You don't have any spears. You have two attacks, yes, but a banner is actually incredibly helpful. The reason it's in your army is so that it can follow around your big heroes. And you gotta what be careful with do, this and make sure it's in the right place. It will like amplify their killing power immensely because it means that they're so much more likely to win a fight. If you have a little 35-point banner or whatever following around Azog, that's terrifying. It's a 35-point upgrade, basically, to give him one reroll in the duel. We which... keep him close so he helps other guys, too. Yeah. Azog's there as insurance to make sure nothing gets around to the banner, and he just trashes stuff while the banner helps him not... There's nothing more annoying than you charge in a big tank of a hero that costs you 200 points or more, and he fluffs, rolls three yeah. or four dice, and doesn't get that six to win. But then you get that one reroll, which has actually saved me on multiple occasions. So always take a banner. And the banner's worth victory points in a couple scenarios. And there's a couple of these other little okay. things that are just sort of bonus when you take it. But the biggest reason is to give some insurance to your heroes. Yeah. In terms of heroes. It, sorry, tell me if you disagree. But <laughs> when you spend a lot of points on a big hero, one of the worst things that can happen to your army is when you lose that hero. That too. So you put some points on a banner. It, it is insurance. It costs more. It's almost good points after bad, but it's not bad.
point. I mean, like you're spending points to get a big hero, protect the hero, use the hero. And if anything hero. else, it's victory points in certain missions. Right. So always take a banner, maximize your shooting, two cavalry and two works, generally at low points. Upgrade your works as you go up in points. Uh, in terms of your hero choices, you've got five named heroes and then your generic captains. Never take your captains. Now, some people may disagree with me with uh, disagree with me bleh, on that, but <laughs> I personally never take captains. The only reason you should ever take captains is one, if you're hoarding hunter orcs, because at that point you're not taking out of a bulk and you just run out of heroes. So if you're so hoarding, you obviously need captains. The other time you'd actually take a generic captain, I say a single generic captain, is when you are taking bulk at 600 points, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, We're going to talk about how you build a 400 at different, or 600, point different point levels of the list. So, and then in terms of your other hero choices, never take your captains. The named hunter orc heroes, so that's Fimble, Narzug, and Yasneg. Always take Fimble, no matter the point value. He is the number one pick in all situations. And the reason for that is because he's fight five. Same point value as all the other heroes. With heroic strike. But, fight five, that's the big thing. Because... He's higher fight value than generic infantry. Generic infantry for most factions are fight three, and their elite option is fight four, which most armies will be fielding their elite option as majority of their army. It really sucks when you've got your hero charging in, and then they just lose a fight on fight value to generic infantry, or if they tie it and then lose the roll off. Fimble just avoids that problem altogether. And then on top of that, he has also got the ability to heroic strike which makes him incredibly useful, because you can throw him against a big tier hero. He can strike up, and then you've got all your hunter works around just to do the insane amount of damage. So in, that's really good. I would always take Fimble, and then he's got the gimmick for the terrain, which never comes into play, but it's nice. I don't even remember that one. Yeah, he's, it's... He's terrain proof? It's, is... He just gets his charge bonus, and he's basically immune right. to difficult terrain. It's weird. I've never actually used... I might have used it once. Usually you're charging other models yeah, that are not necessarily once. hiding in woods or walls, um, right? So, yeah. And now, the reason, another reason is that you take him over the other two. Basically, I can summarize both Narzug and Yasnig in one sentence. Narzug, his only purpose really is to shoot out big hero's horses. That's literally what he's there for. That's why the you take the him over role? the other two. Yes. He's, he's the, the one with lethal aim, where he gets the free might point per turn on his bow, which sounds really good on paper, but realistically that's doing little to nothing and then on top of that you're paying the same amount of points for him as you are for the other two heroes and you're just getting so much more with the other two so play out some scenarios in your head you got a free might per turn on the bow if that was a legolas that'd be a big deal but it's an orc bow it's an orc bow with orc shoot values so often you're using the might to hit uh, you're actually you've not narsic's got improved shoot value so that's that the helps. one good thing. He hits on a four base and then it goes down to a three with your faction bonus. Which means but half the time you're going to use the might to hit. Because it's free, you're going to spin it anyway. So you use the might to hit. And you've got a strength two bow, which is going to struggle to wound. If you have the might left because you haven't spent it yet, you might use it to get a wound off on something. So it's for often shooting horses out of big heroes. Often he's shooting through like two or three ranks of infantry to snipe at a hero. Yep. And then he's so trying you to spend the free horse. might on it in the way. So it just it gets chewed up really fast. And you're tempted to burn his might his real on might. things that aren't worth it. When really, they're there for heroic moves. That's really what you use Narsuk's might for once the lines actually meet. Because he can't strike, and he can, he doesn't have any other heroics besides accuracy. So really, what's he going to do? Combat? Uh, not when he's matching other generic infantry's fight value. The only option he has is really to heroic move. Help control the play. Help make sure you've got your guys where you want them. Heroic move. Fimble at least has other options in the sense that you can actually throw him against a hero and not have to worry about him getting one turned in the sense he can actually do something about it, force them to blow one of their valuable might points to counter strike against your 60 point hero. Uh, and then Yasneg. I hear people love Yasneg because of his lance. I also think that it's cool and when I've used it, it's all right. But I would prefer fight five over a lance any day just simply because that helps in so many more situations. The lance is great, but you have to win the fight first. And that basically summarizes my opinion between him and Yasneg. And then Yasneg's gimmicky rule with Azog. Nah. <laughs> you don't actually, you never, you can straight up kill Yasneg to have Azog auto pass his courage test and have it be a board wide well, effect, so which is really cool. But you have to lose a 60 point model, which probably still has a couple might left at that point. So no. <laughs>
It'd be very few circumstances you do that. So, Fimble's an auto-take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the big guys next, or are you talking about list I building am, first? I because there are very specific point values okay. attached to them. So, if you're building a list centered around Bulg or Azog, you always take Fimble, you take one of the two heroes, and then depending on the point value, that determines what else you take. So, if you're looking at... So, Fimble and a big guy, and then the points determine what else you take. So, as I said before, there are basically three general strategies. There's the sit back and shoot with Bulg, there's the horde of orcs, and then there's the Azog kills all. And Azog Bulk together is not an option unless you get 800 points or higher. So because generally, they just cost so much, they are your yeah, whole So generally, I just talk about those three strategies. Sorry, quick pause. If you take Azog and Bulk, how many points is that? Uh, well, Bulk's 180 and then Azog's 245. So you're going to have a 400 point army against those two guys who are defense 5 and 7. Archery can kill that fast. And that's all it takes is archery. And it's that's too vulnerable. Points. It's too vulnerable. Um, so you don't take the two of them unless you've got a big army around them. Exactly, which isn't a very big army at that point. It's an average army plus two scary heroes, um, which I have done before, and it actually does work, but 800 points minimum for that army. Um, in terms of uh, list strategies, 600 points or less, really your only competitive option, I'd say, is to hoard out on the orcs at 600 points or less. Because you put Azog or Bulg in there, they're like a third of your army. And, and there's a lot you of models can't justify that at that point value. It just doesn't make any sense. You can get so many more models just by hoarding out. And you get ridiculous amounts of might. You can throw Fimble and Yasneg in there. They both can heroic strike to deal with whatever low tier heroes your opponent has at that point value. And, and you'll if you don't have... have a big hero, would that change your opinion about which... Would you favor the, the archery list at that point? Or would you favor... You can't do Azar kills all if you don't have Azar. Well, you can't, you're not doing either of them at that point value. You're just hoarding orcs. Which means you always, like as I, as I said like a while ago, you maximize your shooting always, just to give you that option. So when you hoard the orcs, you've got a crap ton of shooting. So which, you could sit back and shoot depending on what you're up against. And exactly, what the it is. always depends against what you're up against and what you're trying to do with your mission. So, so if you're up against an elven gun line or a bunch of crossbows, you heroic march in and go fight it. It's, yeah. That's when you use generic captains. Yeah. So 600 points and down, you just hoard the orcs. But at 600 points, you do have the slight option. You can field bulk if you want. If you want, at 600 points and up. Yeah, 400, 500. Because no, he's 180, six. which is way less than Azog. And when I say way less, I mean like a whole hero less or half a warband or whatever. It's not a lot, but it is significant. You can justify bulk at 600. Because he is still a hero of valor. So you can lead a bunch of guys with him. You typically will only need like two or three heroes. Two heroes with full warbands, or three heroes with a slightly jiggly empty space in a couple of the warbands. So, if you take Bulk at the 600 points, you have to also take a generic captain. And the reason you take the generic captain is for the Heroic March. Because at that point, you're not using Bulk's might for the Heroic March, even though he has it. He's only got three might points, which you have to spend on his strikes and his combats. The captain's might is expendable, so you use it on the Heroic Marches. When you get to higher point values, 700 plus, then you can field Azog. And at that point, Azog can be your heroic marches. Which sounds a little odd, considering that I just said that you should save Bulg's might, and shouldn't you do the same for Azog's? But Azog has 6 points of might. Which yeah, wait, is a rule? lot. But... He doesn't have a direct. I mean, if you're... Yes. I mean, those of you who are astute, yes. He does not have 6 points of might. But between Azog and the White Warg, and Azog can Which spend the White Warg's might. If you're taking Azog, you take him on the White Warg. You and never you spend take the White Warg's stuff first. Exactly. Well, it depends, but it depends on what you're up against. It, it gets true. finicky sometimes. But general rule of thumb, you should kind of be using the White Warg's first. That's generally how I lead. For marches and things, you'd burn the White Warg's might. Yeah. But 700 points plus, you take Azog, he can be your heroic marches. Because you have enough might on him, you can still do the strikes and the combats and everything while losing a couple of might points, and you don't have to spend 45 points on another yeah. hero. What are we really talking about? Like, two heroic marches is going to get you across the board. Yeah, you so never, it... you should never spend more than two might on heroic marches. He should always have about four might left to spend on strikes and combats. If you throw a heroic move in there, that's fine. But... Strikes and combats, and then just mighting up his dual rules, which you do often end up doing, sometimes. Because dice, they're pickle. Yeah, so, quick overview. Um, 600 points and down, you hoard the orcs. At 600 points, you have the option to take bulk if you want. But if you do take bulk, you also take a generic captain, so you can use the captain's might on the heroic march. 
700 points and plus, you can take Azog. He can be your Heroic March. Because honestly, you don't have the points to get another hero that's just there for Heroic March. You're going to have Fimble well. there still. You Fimble's Fimble there, and, yes. Fimble and Azog. Would you have a third hero with 700 points? Yeah, you do. You always have a third like hero. Like a generic? Or what's, what's your third hero then? So your third hero would be one of the other two named heroes. Yeah. So, so either choose your, Narzig choose your or Yasnag. Yes, yes. Exactly. They're basically Narzig the same. to shoot at would, some other hero horses so as I can go yeah. trash people, something like that. Or you go into allies, which we are going to go into next. So in terms of allies with Azog's Hunters, they have a triple green alliance between Azog's Hunters, Azog's Legion, and the Dark Powers of Dol Guldur. So it's basically it a three-in-one faction. It is Especially nasty. because they have a bunch of overlap. So the Dark Powers have Hunter Orcs as a generic unit which actually makes it incredibly easy for list building. Basically, the only reason you take from the Dark Powers is to get access to their heroes. Yep. Because what do they have for infantry? They've got Hunter Orcs, Gundabad Orcs, and Fel Orcs. You have two of those three options, and the third, the Gundabad Orcs, you just don't want. They don't play towards the, uh, the Hunter Orcs playstyle. The Hunter Orcs are all about raw damage output, not so much about defense, which is really all you're paying for on your Gundabed Orcs. You're Trading paying attacks more for points for one less attack, more defense, which sounds okay in terms of the fact that you're kind of solving your weakness to archery, but at that point you should just play Azog's Legion. Yep. It's a whole different strategy. Exactly. So the real reason you take the Dark Powers is for their Wraiths and their Spiders. And that's really all you're doing. I would never take the Keeper of the Dungeons just because you have so much better value heroes just in Azox Hunters themselves. The Ring Wraiths, though, are really good, particularly the Lingering Shadow. So a at stinker. 700 such points, a stinker. at 700 points, my list has three heroes. It has Azog, and it has Fimble, and then it has the Lingering Shadow. You build out around Azog and Fimble, and, and the Lingering Shadow can bring some exactly. interesting tricks mm -hmm. with him if he likes. So that army becomes very mobile because you have three very fast heroes. The Lingering Shadow gets to teleport about three and a half inches a turn every turn for free. So he basically moves 10 inches, which is the same as a cap model. So you've got three fast heroes, which can all heroic strike, and you have lots of might. Um, the other ally, Azog's Legion. Um, there's really only one thing you want from that faction. They have lots of things which look attractive, but... What do they really add to your army? Again, the Gundabad Orcs. Why would you ally them into Azog's Hunters? You don't want Gundabad Orcs. They don't play towards the playstyle that the Hunters convey. The Hunters are all about just shooting if they can. If not, they just charge in and they just hoard and they wrap Throw around dice flags everybody. and just dice. That's basically the whole strategy of Azog's Hunters. Lots of dice and lots of models. Kind of the same as Goblin Town. I see a trend in the armies I like. Anyway, so basically, with Azog's Legion, the only unit you really want is the Gundabad Berserkers. And now the reason for that, the other options you have, the Gundabad Trolls, the Troll with the Crushing Club, the Scythe Gauntlets, the Ogres, everything like Big that. Big exciting models. What, what are you paying for with those units? You're paying for damage output on a single model that is slow. The whole point of the Azog's Hunters is that they're fast, they hit hard, and they just, they're cheap. They're because squishy, they've got to balance to out them. the cost of their big expensive heroes. Because Azog and Bull chew up a lot of their points. So you need cheap infantry so that you can still keep up with the numbers of other armies. Because at 700 points, people are clocking out at like 30, 40 models. And you need to be able to match that, despite the fact that you're dumping the better part of like 200 points. Yeah into one hero. We can talk about this in another video, but right now, the Legion suffers from some of the same struggles as Fanghorn. Some really exciting, really cool models. Beautiful to build, beautiful to paint. There's some fantastic stuff on the Facebook groups that follow the SPG hobby. Like, it's one of the beautiful armies. It really is. Oh, yeah. and very impressive models to table, but they're tough to play because they're expensive. And if you're going to spend 120 points on an infantry, even if it's a big, scary, trolley infantry or an Entish yeah. infantry, it's 120 points on infantry. If you put 120 points into Hunter Orcs, they're strength two garbage bows. But run the stats, they'll take down an Ent. And they can take down other stuff too. It's it's just messy. So if you're going to spend that many points, you really need a different strategy. And you got to back it up with different things. So if you're talking about a Hunter Orc playlist, they just don't, they don't help. You wouldn't bring, it's too expensive to bring one of those big trolls or a big ogre. Even though it's only a 60-point monster, you can get, like, 
eight hunter orcs for the same cost. So it, and it they just... don't solve any of your weaknesses. Right. They just play to your strengths. So again, the weaknesses for Azog's hunters you can get those strengths for were, eight point models. Yeah. Instead. So the weaknesses for the hunter orcs were low defense, low fight value, and low courage. What do the berserkers have? Higher fight value, higher defense, and higher courage. They are fight four, which means they can match most infantry from other armies, which is actually really good. You put them in the middle of your battle line, and suddenly you're not outfought, and you actually have a decent line, because they're all two attacks. They can match the two ranks, the front rank and the spears. So you got equal number of dice, plus a banner, which they'll likely have a banner they're as well. Allied, so they can take the banner from the hunter orcs. Yeah, with no penalty. And you can take a good to bad banner if you really want, but... Um, so really... They have the fight for mm -hmm. they still contain the two attacks so you're not losing anything attack wise you're gaining defense five which d4 to d5 is actually a big jump because suddenly strength two bows need sixes to wound you and strength four bows need fives and when i say strength four bows i'm really referring to crossbows but basically the really scary archery won't hit you as hard the only thing that stays the same is elves and elves are just annoying so <laughs> On top of that, they also have Courage 6, which is ridiculously good. I cannot say how helpful having like a handful of Courage 6 models is. If you're fighting an army that causes terror, like Army of the Dead, which is for some reason ridiculously popular nowadays, might have something to do with the fact that they were overpowered of the Legendary <laughs> Legion. <laughs> we might but, have to do a video on that at some oh, point. Oh, Devin already did a video yeah, on that. Yeah, that's a good and one too. As soon as I watched it, I'm like, oh, I have to play that army now. <laughs> but no. Anyway, and they're they're doing well at tournaments that we've been at lately. Yeah, so there's a lot of so army of the dead showing. If up. you're fighting an army of the dead army, they all cause terror. Because they have the will. king of the dead, which causes harbinger of evil. Yep. So your whole army's courage one. How are you supposed to fight the army of the dead? You can't charge them. They can charge you wherever they want, which means it's a two on two dice situation because they've got the one guy with the spear and you've got one hunter orc, and they and win no the fight. Spear options. And they win the fight. They're wounding you on threes. You are just going to get destroyed. Because they wound against your courage. So exactly. they're wounding against the courage one model. So Which, it's... it's a difference of two, so they wound you on threes. And there's not much you can do about that. The only thing you really can ever pass a courage test with is Azog. And then he's courage four. And if he goes against the king of the dead, king of the dead's like, you only have one fate. You're gone. <laughs> so, so you have to win. So realistically, the berserkers add something huge. The courage six, even if you only have six of them which I would recommend. Six is the magic number for my experience. Six is enough so that you can have them in the middle of your battle line, or you can split them off into two groups of three, and they can go help off in smaller fights. But that's enough of them that you can hold, and you can pass those terror tests and hold your center line. Or you can have them sitting off in objectives, in missions where that actually matters, like domination or heirlooms, if you just want to like ditch a berserker and move on and keep searching the other ones. Courage six means if you break, they're actually a higher courage than your heroes. Which, Which is kind of crazy. It's weird to think about, <laughs> but yes, they're higher courage than your heroes. They are more likely to stick around than Azog. But Azog no, Azog's well. kind of well to spend, but... So, they add something very valuable. And then the smaller thing that people don't actually tend to remember is the 8-inch movement. And the 8-inch movement, while it's not a lot, it's only an extra 2 inches, it's actually incredibly helpful. It just adds another element of the fast-moving hunter orcs. You've got 10-inch moving warks, you've got 10-inch moving calf, you've got 8-inch moving infantry. And people often forget about that. Especially, Especially if you pull if you something play. very sneaky, <laughs> which I often like to do, and people have gotten kind of annoyed at this before, but it's okay. Um, where if you move your berserkers with your hunter warks, and you move your infantry as a block, as allies and playing no, them and as you an move army. them 6 inches yep. with the rest of your hunter warks, people will straight up forget that they move 8 inches. They think they're out of charge range, they're sitting back and shooting you, and you're like, nope. Then you charge in with your berserkers, just tie up their whole battle line so they can't shoot, and then you just march up, safe from archery for a turn, and then the lines meet, and you're good. The 8-inch movement is very helpful, especially with, as said before, I think I did, actually, no, I didn't say this before, with a heroic march. Yeah. Because then you have 11-inch moving infantry, which is great. Especially time and place, but it really does matter sometimes. Especially in heirlooms of ages past. Yep. Yeah. Heirlooms of Ages Past is the one where you have the one objective in the middle. Most people use objectives that are more than one inch in diameter. So often, if you have an objective in the middle of the table, particularly with the poker chips that most people tend to use, like the ones from Nova or the ones from the OSBGL or ones from other systems, like I've seen a couple GBHL ones and everything like that, um, they all tend to be large enough that if you have 12-inch deployment 
11 inch heroic march you're making base contact which means turn yeah. one you can dig up the heirloom with a berserker which is honestly your best infantry if you're not giving it to a berserker you're giving it to a warg and i personally prefer the berserker because they're courage six and they still have that crazy rule too right just because yeah. they're crazy so it's the they... oblivious to pain stuff yeah. which never works but it's fun 16 <laughs> percent um, of the time when you take a wound you roll a die and 16 percent of the time he's going to be so crazy he just ignores the wound i played five games at tgx and i passed two nice <laughs> so but it anyway. helps it does it's a little but it's not uh, a bad thing if you've got that guy carrying the objective away and running it back to your army it's good he's probably going to take some archery on his run and he's that much more likely to survive so allies if you're going with azog's legion you're taking the berserkers and the other reason that you'd always go for azog's legion i would never take hunter works without allying azog's legion and the reason for that is because if you're taking azog which i recommend <laughs> He's so good. At the 700 point level. At the 700 point level, which is very common. Most tournaments are around that level. In our area. That's if gonna you be. take Azog, yeah. and you take him from Azog's Legion, which I know this is kind of unthematic, and at this point you're kind of not playing Azog's Hunters, but you still are. If you take him from Azog's Legion, he's still your general. He has to be your general. He's a hero point. of legend. He's still he the automatically gets Master of Battle for free. And big, that gives you the deal. free might that we were talking about before. And at that point, it's even more okay to spend his might on heroic marches. Master of battle, meaning if anybody calls a heroic action within six inches six of inches. him, he copies it for free. Doesn't and he can copy any. ones he doesn't actually have in his profile. Right. So in his profile, he's got strike, uh, march, strength, and challenge. But he can call a heroic defense. If yeah. someone calls a heroic defense within six inches, he can copy it. I had something very ironic happen. It was gambling versus... Azog at one point. They were just both heroic defensing against each other. It sucked. I was trapped. I couldn't go around him, but it was alright. I ended up killing him anyway. Made him more durable. Um, you get these awkward moments with... <laughs> Master of Battle is a funny rule that way. It just creates weird moments in the game. Yeah. Oh yeah, I guess that can't happen. So and Every now and then. If you're taking Azog's Hunters, I would always ally in Legion. Can, can I say, you know this army better than I do, but one thing I know, because I've played it and I've watched it go well both ways, the biggest thing that Master of Battle does is it lets you control the field of play. It does. Because if you get priority, then you've got priority. But if they call a heroic move, you counter for free. So you're getting free heroic moves all the time, or you have priority, and you're not spending might on that, and you're draining their might. So it's powerful because it controls the field of play. And if they get a couple heroic moves off and you lose the roll off, and they, that's fine. They spent might, you didn't. And the next round, you can call the heroic move for free again until they're out of might. And when they're out of might, then you just, you just drive. And you can, at that point, you're in... Powerful oh, yeah. And yeah, he's scary in Lords of Battle when you're fighting an all hero army. Sorry for our Justin. I fought his uh Rangers and Dunedain in Lords of Battle That's with Azog. Tough. Every model's a hero. Every hero you kill is a might back. So he burns might, kills a hero, gets might, kills another yep. hero, gets more might. It was it was yeah. awful, but it was amazing at the same time. Um so allies. If you're going with Azog's Legion, you take Azog from Azog's Legion. The other thing that lets you do is give him heavy armor, which suddenly your general, instead of being defense 5, is defense 7, which makes a huge difference. And then on top of that, you can also give him the Stone Flail, which is still ridiculously overpowered, and despite the fact that. that they doubled its point value. Yeah, you can only do that in the Legion. In the right? Legion, exactly. Stone is the only, that's the only place you can Which, get it. brief recommendation on the Legion, ah, sorry, on the Stone Flail. Always use it against infantry, unless, of course, they're stinking elves that are fight six. And then always use it against low-level heroes that you outfight, because it's free. You just have to remember to do it. As long as you outfight them at fight six, you should always be doing it, because it's D3 wounds and it's a two-handed weapon, which is insane, and it's wonderful. If you're using, if you're fighting against a hero, though, always remember your heroic strike does not stack on your stone flail. So if you use the Stone Flail and you also Heroic Strike, you go up to whatever fight value you go up to and then drop to fight 6. Never use the Stone Flail when you're fighting a hero that is equal or higher fight value than you. Unless, of course, you fluff your Heroic Strike and then you're just in trouble, but you use the Stone Flail anyway. So, that's my <laughs> yeah. one minute how to use the Stone Flail. <laughs> and also, if Azog is alone and the rest of your army has died, and you were fighting a bunch of infantry. Whirl. Every turn. Just whirl. Whirl over and over until all the infantry die. I swear, it'll work. <laughs> it's a little annoying. It's, like, it's ridiculous. There's a couple... I've got a fun story. We've got to go off on a tangent A couple characters now. in the game, Thranduil and Azog, can take whole armies on We've their own. We've got to go it's... on a tangent here. I played a game at a tournament, and 
I'm sorry, I cannot remember the fellow's name. Um, what was his army? Ah, uh, Gondor. He was playing Gondor. I remember that because that Shieldwall Gondor. No, it was it was not Shieldwall Gondor. It was Fountain Court Guard Gondor. So he it's the Gondor I play, but it was with Boromir of the White Tower instead of Elisar. So he had the six inch banner with the plus one fight value, which I didn't realize it was turned into a six inch banner, which caught me off like off guard. He had fight five Fountain Court Guard, which sucked. Didn't matter though. Wrecked his army for fight three. He destroyed my entire army in two turns. I'm not joking. It was, it was just bad. Azog, the Lingering Shadow, my banner, and a single Berserker. Like, that was it. Against what? Like a 30-model army? Uh, Boromir only had one might point left at that point. He had Huron the Tall, who was on foot, because Fimble had managed to kill his horse before he died. Um, and then it was, I think I killed two models. When he killed almost my entire army. He killed off the rest of my army, so it was just Azog and the Lingering Shadow. And then Azog tanked his entire army. He killed Boromir, he killed Huron, he killed the captain, and then he killed 34 infantry on the dot and won me the game. That's Azog. Azog! <laughs> so, three ways to build this list. Archery, all archery. You build it on archery anyway, but it's the sit-back-and-shoot yep. gameplay style. Yep. You build it on sit-back-and-shoot, you build it on hoard out the infantry, or you build it on Azog. Yep. And, but you don't do that under 700 points. No. Azog right? is 700 points and up, Bulg is 600 points and up. And the horde is 600 and below. How would you go shopping for this army? Um, so, what to buy? First thing you should always buy is obviously Hunter Orcs. So, yeah. you get two boxes of Hunter Orcs. Actually, no, it's one in the new edition. It's one box of 20 Hunter Orcs. 20 infantry should be enough 24 to get infantry. 24, 24 in the box? packs of 12. Okay. Uh, 24, you can convert one banner out of that. Then you have 23 plus a banner, which is honestly enough unless you're doing the horde strategy. Then you get Thimble. He is your first purchase because you are always using him. No matter the point value, no matter what build of army you're playing, he's always in the list. Then you get either Azog or Bulg. One or the other. You don't need both. Probably depends on your local tournament scene. Yeah. In our tournament scene, we see a couple events a year at the 700 point level and more, like 8 to 13 events. There's going to be about 13 events in our season year. Yeah. About 8 of them are going to be 600 points and down. Um, sort of 400 to 650, yeah. I guess. 650 would end down. So, if so, you're in a scene that generally yeah. plays lower point values, I would recommend getting Bulk first, just because you're more likely to use them. Just get the one you're more likely to use, which one you're more likely to have fun with. So, Fimble, Azog, or Bulk in a box of Hunter Works. Um, if you feel like really investing, next up is a box of Felwargs. Um, what you can do, if you're really adventurous, you can actually go ahead and convert two of the Felwargs and two of the Hunter Works to be two mounted Hunter Works. Yep. If you're really good, I've seen people do some really epic conversions. Not bad. Yep. Um, if you have the money, you can just buy the box of mounted hunter orcs. But you're really never going to use more than two of them, as I said before. Two of them is enough so that you can just get the cap bonuses and negate heroes' charges and fun stuff like that. So at that point, you will have four fell orcs, two mounted hunter orcs, twenty-four hunter orcs on foot, one of them with a but banner. Twenty-one and one with a banner and two you put on orcs. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Which is enough. Which is still enough. You got 20 plus, you're good. And then you've got two solid heroes, which can actually lead like that entire group because you've got a 30 model cap almost. It's a very cost effective way to um, start it too. It's not and bad. then the next thing you're going to want to do is actually go out and get two boxes of good to bad berserkers. Because that will give you the list flexibility that you need in the higher point values. And obviously you want a third hero at that point as well. It's really your preference at that point. There is no actual mounted hunter orc captain. So you're just going to have to go with either, either Fimble or Narzig. Uh, not Fimble, I already said Fimble. Yasnag, there Yaznag it is. Or I'd recommend Yasnag over Narzig because there is no mounted Narzig model. And that way you can just have the foot and mount in one pack. And it's you nice can always easy. convert one, but it's easier if you pick up the GW model. So, and they're brilliant sculpts. It actually has yeah. a really nice army. So quick overview. You get a box of Hunterworks. You get Fimble. You get either Azog or Bulg. Probably Bulg if you're playing in a lower point value tournament scene. You'll use them more often. Then you get one box of Thelwargs, convert a couple of them to be mounted. If you have the money, then next you'd buy the six pack of mounted Hunter Orcs. And then after that, you'd get another hero. And then after that, you get two boxes of good and bad berserkers from Forge World. So, we've covered a lot of ground in this video. Please, leave us some comments. If you have any thoughts, if you've played this army and you've got different experiences than he does, then we'd love to hear from you. We're not quite done, but... There's an awful lot that we've covered in this video. We'd love to hear your comments. And if, if you, you agree disagree or disagree, with me on if you've got some building, ideas. Like if yeah. you like Yasnake, for example. Yeah, explain why. I kind of like him, but I don't really like him that much. And I've seen people <laughs> like uh, like Tom from the GBHL. They love Yasnake. But personally, I just don't see why I'd ever take him over Fimble. 
and the other options are so much better. I'd take the Lingering Shadow even before I'd take Yasnik. So, Interesting. now we can go into specific missions and how you'd actually play this army at a tournament, for example. So, there are basically three types of missions. There's the Go Kill the Other Guy, which basically constitutes of To the Death, Lords of Battle, Clash by Moonlight, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, and then there's the objective-based ones, like Capture and Control, Domination, and Heirlooms of Ages Past. And then there's the others, like Reconnoiter and Seize the Prize and Storm the Camp. So they're all based around different things. For example, To the Death and Lords of Battle. If you outshoot the other person, so if you outnumber them in bow shots, and you outnumber them in terms of potential damage output, so if they have little to no archery, and you have your around like 15, 16 shots, which you should have, then... You can sit back and shoot comfortably. Just take the free dice until they get up close to you, and then lines meet, and then you can just deal with whatever's left. If they a outshoot lot of it'll you, still be left at that point, but yeah. hopefully it's a little thinner than it was before, and the shooting has yeah. done its job. If they outshoot you, you're just going to have to march across the board. Life sucks sometimes when you're fighting against elves mm -hmm. or against dwarven ballista or anything like that. You're going to have to use the captains to heroic march if you're at lower point values, or if you're at the 700 points and up, you can use Azog. Just march your way across the table. Generally, two marches is enough. You don't want to blow any more might than that, especially if you're using Azog's might. It would affect your deployment, too. You're going to see exactly. the other army before you deploy, so if you know you're deploying up against a nasty gun line that outguns you, then deploy so that you can get your guys yeah. close enough to all benefit from the march. You can exactly. Them up as a block. You basically end up as this big bubble around Azog. Um, Azog in the front so that he can move first. Everybody exactly. follows. Exactly, and then everyone yeah. gets in front of him, and then same, he runs around and then whatnot. Yeah. It gets messy on the second turn, but you'll get the idea. Uh, the second type, the objective-based missions. Capture, control, domination, heirlooms. You want to get your army all together. Hold ground is also kind of in this, but it's only one objective. Um, so capture, control, domination, they're basically the same mission. You deploy center line unless you re like feel really confident in the fact that you can tear their army apart with shooting completely and then take the objectives afterwards. I would highly not recommend or... this. Yeah. No, especially not against yeah, goblins. Yeah, yeah. There's you gonna be never so sit back and them. shoot against goblins. You will never get to the objectives. Um, sorry, that's a tangent. Uh, if you're playing against goblins. It makes sense. If they've goblins, got that many models <laughs> against you, you got to get to the objectives, so you can't just sit and shoot. You can't sit yeah. and shoot. They will Lake just... Town, you'd struggle similarly. The Shire, you'd struggle so similarly. So, with Hunter Orcs, you numbers. deploy on the center line. If it's capture control, you can just go back, flip your home objectives with your fell wargs, and then come back and join the fight. Basically, you're going to want to stay as close together as you can, crunch their army as much as possible, and then last turn, like, heroic combat off, break off, whatever you can, just to flip the objectives. Basically, you're going to go for a hold three out of the five mission. Uh, as opposed to all five. You're just going to be shooting for three out of the five. And then destroy their general with Azok if you can. Um, which shouldn't be much of a problem. Um, if you're doing heirlooms or hold ground. Uh, scatter deployment sucks. But let's face it. It's in the tournament scene everywhere. Azog always goes out last. This is general rule of thumb. Make sure you know where your other warbands are. So that you can use might to get where you want. Um, typically people will throw out their important stuff first and then use the less important stuff's might to go with the important stuff. But with Azog, generally speaking, he's got so much more might and he's got Master of Battle if you're taking from Azog's Legion. So he's got potential free might to make up for the fact that he had to waste some of it on deployment. So I always go with him last because his might is somewhat replaceable. Whereas the other people, once they spend their might, they're basically useless. So everything else goes out first. Try to keep it together if you can. If you have to blow a couple of might, that's okay. It's better than being scattered all over the board. And then Azog goes out last. Use whatever might you have to to make sure he's not alone. If you have to use all six, you shouldn't because the minimum result you can roll is a one. Just suck it up. Just stay off the board and then roll next turn. Um, and then the other missions. Reconnoiter and Storm the Camp. Which basically... Are the exact same thing. Get to the other guy's side of the board as fast as you can. Hold it while protecting your own. So basically, you're going to have to march across. You're just going to have to. You can... Trying to kill everything on your way. Yeah. If I've done this before where I thought I was going to lose and then I'd sit back and try to do as much damage as possible. So this was in a unique situation where I was fighting against Joseph Hanlon from the OSBGL who had Solid a Moranin Orc Horde army with the Witch King of Angmar. So I had my Azog, and I had my Hunter Orcs, and I was like, crap, he's got casting. 
So I'm going to sit back and try to knock out that Witch King before we get into combat. I had like 16 shots a turn going into that Witch King. It did not work. But in that situation, it was worth sitting back and shooting for me. In most situations, it's not. And you should just be rushing across the board as fast as you can. If you run into a funny, unique situation, then it's understandable. But I would always recommend just marching across, getting into their edge, locking them down, just prevent them from getting into yours, send your fast units around to make trouble it's in the, the back. the difference between playing to your strengths and playing to their weaknesses. Playing to their weaknesses doesn't always help. you got to play your strengths first. And if you can overcompensate your weaknesses with your strengths, if your strengths happen to match their weaknesses, then you're in great shape. But oh, yeah. if you're sitting back and playing, sort of catering to your weaknesses, trying to protect on your low defense and low fight, but you're really waiting for them to play to their strengths, and you might regret that. So you can... Anyway. Yeah. Um, and then that's basically all I have to say for overarching missions. Um, you should be able to kill their general no problem if you have Azog or Bold, particularly if you have Azog. Um, if you know how to do the good old heroic combat trick, if you can get Azog and Fimble or any other hero with might into a single combat together, you can call a heroic combat with whoever the other hero is. Wait to see if they heroic strike. If they don't, kill them. If they do, copy it for free. And then if you can just look around, see if you come up with a better idea. If you come up with a better idea, take it. Just trash something else. Or just if you think you can murder the hero, you can murder it. And then Azog gets all that for free. So Azog is great at killing heroes. It's tons of fun. Azog is brutal at killing everything. Starting in fight seven is a big advantage. It's great, actually. If he was fight six, yeah. it would make all the difference in the world. Which yeah, GW, really he should not be fight seven. But I love it that he's fight seven. Um, There's very few models in the game that are above fight six. He's one of them. And then kind of weird, we've yeah. already touched on how to fight terror-causing armies, and that's yeah. basically it for how to play Azog's Hunters. We covered a lot of ground. There's probably some stuff in here that helped you, I hope. There's probably some stuff in here that you have your own experiences with. So again, yeah. please comment. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. We're so glad you joined us. Michael Venom, and we'll see you again soon on another Eric Quinn Caledron video. Thanks for watching.